Welcome to the Authentic Man podcast. I am your host, David Chambers. This is a podcast for men who want more and less from life. More deep connection, more emotional intelligence, more self-awareness and more great sex. And less. Less heartache, less conflict, less overthinking and less stress. Creating dating lives, sex lives and relationships that are incredible and authentic. My deepest goal is that you, the listener, can take away what you hear in this podcast and apply it to your life so that you can experience greater happiness, transformational growth, deeper relationships and profound sexual intimacy. I believe that as men, we are capable of so much more depth than we are shown or led to believe. So join me as we get deep into this. Welcome, 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 welcome. Welcome back to another amazing episode of the Authentic Man podcast. I'm your host, David Chambers. I'm a men's coach. I coach men in dating and intimacy, helping them create deeper connection with themselves and the the women that they meet and the women that they date and the women they're in relationship with, you know, work on multiple levels with them, of course, purpose, feeling, emotional intelligence, and really uncovering their, their kind of authentic, true selves. So today's episode, amongst this London heat wave, if, if you're in London, you know, it's been a bit of a heat wave. And when there's a heat wave in London, everyone's a bit crazy. Uh, luckily for me, I've stayed indoors all day coaching and and so forth um today's episode is all about the basking archetypes and they are you know the king the warrior the magician and the lover and really these archetypes create a map an understanding of a of an energy of of a, a map of the psyche that is embodied in all men but also women there's archetypes have different names for women and can give us understanding of you know where we need to go, what we need to do, our next steps and so forth in life. Um, and I've got a wonderful, wonderful guest to to kind of go through this with, with a, a guy called Kevin. I've come to find Kevin Oras. He's a high performance coach. He's a workshop and retreat facilitator and a podcast host as well. He's got one for podcasts as well. Um, he's really a man that's living deeply in his heart and deeply in action of service to himself, but also to, to all the people that he serves in terms of the men and women that he coaches and works with and runs retreats for. He's a speaker, author, mentor, and performance philosopher, which if you're unsure of what that means, we get into talking about that at the beginning of the episode. Um, so yeah, so it's a great episode. We talk a lot about the archetypes, what they mean, how we can embody them to embody healthy, healthier masculinity. So I think that's a big thing for me is how we can embody healthy masculinity. We know a lot about toxic masculinity, which we talk a little bit about in the episode. But it's like, how can we embody healthy masculinity? You know, how can we embody the healthy lover, the healthy king, the healthy warrior, the healthy magician? And those are really important parts to give our lives direction as men. And as I said, for women, it's not much different. There's just slightly different names. And it's femininity, not masculinity. But there's a few good books out there for, for the ladies around that as well. And we talk about the shadow, the darker side the dysfunctional side of some of these archetypes as well, which is very important to know, um, especially if you've ever suffered addiction, um, a lack of drive, a lack of confidence, or ever feeling that you you don't know and you're stupid or anything like that. It's really important that you, you, know, you understand that those things are also contained inside the archetypes. So yeah, it's been, it was a great, it was a great um, opportunity to record with Kevin. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot actually which is always nice. I love to learn when I am recording these episodes. Um, so I feel super grateful for that as well. And I also want to let you know that I have, um, you know, a few workshops coming up in the not too distant future. I've just put most of them live. Um, so the dates I have is I have a workshop called Being Authentically Attractive, which I really love running. It's really about how we can be more authentic to create more attraction in our lives, whether that's in our dating lives, our relationships, and even in our careers and so forth. And I go through probably about 15 pieces of, of my advice about being more authentic. And I also talk about how authentic, inauthenticity shows up in our life. And that's on the, the 19th of August. There's all the links to this is going to be inside the show notes. So you can find them there. 
um, the Art of Foreplay, which is a men's only workshop uh, for men, really just helping them understand how to have more deeply connected foreplay and be more in tune with the, the women they're with. That is, is, is mainly for men who sleep with women, that workshop, and that's on the 25th of August. Mindful Masturbation for Men is a new workshop I'm running. And this has come through the last couple of years of my own delving through my tantric work, but also through trying to become more connected to my body so that I could be more connected during sex and intimacy. So I basically created this way of masturbation that becomes more in tune, more feeling based and less mechanical and less about release, less about stress and and fear, which a lot of, I know a lot of you guys end up masturbating when you're stressed, you're anxious, you're uncomfortable. So this is bringing masturbation to a much more healthy place for you. And I run that on the 1st of September and I'd love you to join me. It's a really good one. I'm really looking forward to running that for the first time. I've got my workshop, Boost Your Sexual Performance. That's on the 9th of September. Again, it says, does what it says on the tin. I talk you through various practices around how we can really as men become better lovers by being able to be more present but also being able to last longer or last as long as you would like to which I like to say I think is the most important thing it's not about being a porn star and lasting for hours and hours it's about long, lasting as long as you would like to and that's on the 9th of September and the last one is creating the spark which is on the 22nd of September and that's a workshop all about how we can use conversation on our dates to create the spark to create that chemistry to create that connection with somebody because I think that's something that's really going to be lacking in these months now that we're going back out into the world, If you, especially if you're in the UK and if you're in other parts of the world, then you're still potentially still quite locked down. But creating that spark and connection authentically, openly, honestly, without manipulation or coercion, but actually using who you are to, to use to connect deeply with someone. So those are the workshops I've got coming up. If you have any questions, feel free to ping me over. Um, of those, I think there are going to be probably some more workshops coming up around uh, Tantra that we're running with also. But until then, that's what's on offer. Um, and if you're interested in coaching, you know the usual place to get me at Authentic Man on Instagram or hello at theauthenticman.net online. So I think that's all my other business. Um, I would like to make a request though, actually, it's the last thing. If you're listening to this and you've listened to past episodes and you've enjoyed it, please, I'd be deeply grateful to you if you hop over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and just leave a rating and a review. And the reason I ask is because the more ratings and review I have, the more people find my podcast, the more visible it is, the more people get the help, the knowledge, the information and the insight that the, the guests and myself provide. You know, I've been getting a lot of great feedback from people telling me how much the episodes have been helping them. So I'd be really eternally grateful if you just, you know, gave some energy back and popped a little rating review on Apple and so forth. It'd be massive help to me. So thank you in advance for that. And yeah, without further ado, we'll get into this episode of the Authentic Man podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got another epic podcast for you with another epic guest. This is a man who I came across on Instagram and you know, often you see someone's content and you just like your heart just goes, yes, I love this. This I feel this. I resonate with this. This is this resonates with my experience of life as well, what I've gone through myself. So, so I pinged him a message and he was happy to come along and, and speak. And the man before me is uh, Kevin. Awesome to be here, David. Good to have you. So Kevin is a high performance coach and a, rec- uh, a retreat and workshop facilitator. And he also has his own podcast which is a re- re- revolution. Yeah. And he's also a speaker, a mentor, a performance philosopher, which we'll definitely get into a bit more. And also um, an author of a wonderful book around sex, masculinity, and God. That's right. Thank you. Great to have you. Great to have you. How are you doing today? Feeling really amazing. It's been a, it's been a powerful day. Feeling grateful and, uh, yeah, I love I love being interviewed because I interview so many people on my podcast mm. and I love being on the other side. Yeah, yeah. So really is I find it to be um it's so much easier being on the other side because you just you just freely let what comes through you. You don't have to worry about any planning or organization. It's a wonderful place to be. I lo- I love it. I've been doing a lot of Instagram lives with 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 some amazing women and it's lovely to be on the other side because I can just receive the questions and just let it flow really easily. Hopefully it'll be a bit more conversational than a straight interview today. <laughs> so actually the first question I want to ask you is about performance philosopher. What is a performance philosopher? 
Yeah, this is a this is a moniker I've I've borrowed and tried on, and I really embody and love um, from Alan Watts. So Alan Watts is a great archetype and a beautiful mentor in my life of performing philosophy. So you know, it's not like being in a university class or you're just being talked at. It's an interactive dialogue, dialectic inquiry. And philosophia, the Greek, you know, the word philosophy, philosopher is a lover of wisdom. So it's, it's one of my favorite ways to transmit information. And um, I studied philosophy and psychology in school. And once upon a time was going to do my PhD in psychology before my awakening. And now it put me on this path as an entrepreneur. Um, but yeah, I still love to perform philosophy. Beautiful. It's, we often see philosophy as this very fixed, very dry, quite boring. And, and in fact, you know, it's a, it is a dialogue. You know, I always think of Socrates, right? Socrates just goes back to one of the, the people I've really read about and loved. And I loved how with him, it was always a conversation of learning for both people, you know? Whereas yes. a lot of the time we feel with philosophy, it's this thing that's been decreed by some extremely intelligent man and we just have to take it on and receive it and find some way to understand it so the performance element that you put in there is like it's a it's a two-way road you know exactly exactly beautiful ah i love that so as you said you you've you've come to this work and i'm always interested to find out from the men that i speak to is like how did you come to this work what drew you to the to the work that you do today yeah, I ask myself that question often, you know, it, it's really one of those things of um, when you follow your bliss, Joseph Campbell, um, you find that life has, you know, a life to be lived, you don't have to create it or carve it out. And that's really how I found the work that I find myself in being a mentor, a creator, a speaker, an author, and a transmitter of the information around, you know, masculine rites of passage, brotherhood, healthy sexuality, and also about, you know, how to do business in a good way and how to be a steward of, of the new earth, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. So, you know, it found me. I thought I was going to be a lawyer when I entered university studying political science and I found psychology and philosophy, thought I was going to be an academic, um, was going to go down that path and was really paving into that to become a professor in psychology, maybe even a psychoanalyst when I discovered Jung's work. And then, you know, through a series of awakenings, which was, you know, infidelity, plant medicine, yoga, martial arts, just getting rocked and red pilled basically into the path I'm on now. And I've just been discovering ever since. And a lot of that has looked like um, a lot of sacrifice and, and movement in the world. So selling all my possessions, um, moving to California, you know, entering festival culture, going to Burning Man, entering these communities of, of permaculture, of psychedelics, of entrepreneurship, and then traveling the world. So traveling through Southeast Asia, um, living there, backpacking, um, and then going to India and Nepal to study yoga and breath work and meditation and doing the full circle, coming back home to LA. And I founded a lifestyle brand with my two, two good friends years ago, um, Mystic Misfit, where we started running retreats and I started really practicing authentic relating, started really practicing bioenergetics, um, breath work and nonviolent communication and running these dojos, running these retreats. And then that's when I really found um, the masculine mentors and found men's work. So I um, had the privilege of working with Elliot Hulse early in his career when he was like super into the Osho tradition and active meditations and also Wilhelm Reich and somatic bioenergetics and also men's work, the masculine archetypes, rites of passage. And I got involved with a lot of events with that. I went through a lot of um, trainings and immersions and really I've just been writing it ever since. Um, yeah, following that, that inclination, really studying, practicing coaching and mentorship at a high level and running my business um, with, that, with that mission in mind. And it's taken me to amazing, beautiful places. And I'm still on that journey. Sounds like a real journey of sinking through the depths of yourself and what's there of those different layers. And then also then, like I feel like you, you, you kind of go through yourself and then you come back out and then you kind of push yourself into the world and feel into the world and be, do, kind of 
expand your awareness of what's possible and what's out there and what you can yeah. be capable of. Totally. What a journey. Sounds like you've, sound like there's a, a biography in you somewhere soon and not too long. Yeah, yeah, there is. It'll definitely be written in the next 10 years, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Because it sounds like a real journey, you know, because a lot of people, we get um, taught that we should do that whole go to college or university, get a good job that's going to, you know, last us our lives, you know, we'll be, we'll be safe and secure and because everything's going to be perfect. We'll buy a house, we'll have a couple, two, 2.4 children, they say in the UK, right? right. And, you know, it's going to be beautiful. But actually, that's not how things really turn out for a lot of people. Right. And this is this is that following the bliss path, you know, they call it the left hand path. If you actually do what you love and get curious about what you're good at. So everyone has innate talents and also what you're driven to do. So I was following that thread into mythology and philosophy, the hero's journey into Tantra, into you know, sexuality into initiation through, through yoga, through Qigong, through, you know, meditation. And, you know, I've discovered a thread that pulled me through, you know, the life that was built for me, the, the, what you described, which was for me would have been grad school and then a university job and then blah, blah, blah. You know, I was trying to force myself into that. I was suffering. And so the admitting of that and breaking out of that pattern was really where the rubber met the road. Amazing how pain is a is a is an amazing way to see to 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 create awareness to what's not right for you, what's not working for you. Often we we think that pain is always a bad thing if we come up against it, but actually I say this to a lot of my clients is like on the other side of pain is often so much beauty if you can just make your way through it. Yes. Mm. Cool. That's a beautiful message. And I imagine a lot of this is going to come up through the, through the episodes and the things that we, we get into. But we want to really get into the, the masculine archetypes, because it's something that I learned about a number of years ago, actually, and then started to see the world slightly differently and myself differently and see where those balances is. Balance, balances and imbalances live, right, in, in terms of my, my energy and where I'm putting myself and what I'm focusing on. So it'd be great to get a, an idea from, from your side and what you see as the, the kind of the core masculine archetypes. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this has become the core of my work with men and women. Um, the feminine archetypes are complementary mm -hmm. and very similar. Um, and really they're older than, you know, these books that describe them. So Carl Jung is well known because he, he really went deep into the archetypes and laid the groundwork and then Robert Moore, who was a was a practitioner at Minnesota Men's Conference and a men's um, therapist and mentor for 40 years. You know, he really detailed the King, Warrior, Lover, Magician, wrote that book. And there's been a whole movement since, but they're they're older than than humanity. So all ancient people related to these archetypes and we can see them in mythologies. We can see them in the cave paintings and these oral traditions around the world on every continent. So it's an ancient way to relate to the human experience and the human psyche. And for the man, for the masculine experience, you know, you have these four quadrants of energy types and roles and gifts and challenges that each man has to alchemize. And the fifth element is the totality where you, you know, and this ideally is in your old age where you have moved through all the archetypes and mastered their gifts and, and in your unique way. So, you know, we have the warrior execute, implement, you know, go to the target, you know, setting boundaries, hunting very powerful. A lot of men come into that in their twenties and really bring it online. It's really powerful in business. It's necessary for relationships to start them. It's also necessary to, to train, you know, it's training and discipline. Um, then we have the magician. The magician is that wizard, that mystic. It's a connection to God. It's connection to nature. It's the inner knowing the intuition. It's secret knowledge, understanding cause and effect. The mature magician is able to initiate other men into these rites of passage and initiation. Um, they also serve the king. So the king archetype is the leader, the sovereign, the commander, the, the empowered leader in a man that every man possesses and relates to who can actually command territory and knows with his vision where the group needs to go, where the family, the kingdom needs to go, the village. And then we have the lover. You know, The lover is that good father, the artist, the expression, the passion of the masculine. This is where 
you know, the sexual, emotional and artistic fulfillment comes into life and lets a man actually enjoy his life as it is. And so you have to have a relationship to all these archetypes as a man to live a, a total being and a total life. And they interact with each other. They're complementary. They're, they're, they're oppositional also at times in life where it builds dynamic tension. And I found them to just be a master map to navigate the male experience in all layers. I love what you started off with about how it's been, it's an, it's an all, all cultures, you know, and you, you, you come across the world and there's always this idea of the, the sovereign, the, the, the ruler. There's always some form of warrior and there was some sort of magician, like, you know, in every culture, there's also always some sort of medicine man or shaman, like they, they everyone holds in it. And there's also, I, I love that. I am a big fan of the lover archetype because it's like to experience and enjoy what is there and also to see beauty like really really like stop and stare at a tree for a little while you know it's something that as as a lot of men we don't um engage in the beauty of life we engage in the function of life a lot I and mean, we lose out on some of the, the the beauty that's really there but these have been really strong ways to, for me personally to like look at situations and be like okay i'm at work and something's going wrong here and i'm like where am i where am I in these four archetypes and where am I being a bit kind of dysfunctional? Where am I lacking here? And it's, it's, it's a really great way to look at any, dis, any situation in any place you are in your life or, or what you're trying to, um, to create and look at that. Because if there is a harmony to a degree, I don't mean balance when I say harmony, because there are times when, you know, you might be, you might be trying to get a promotion and you need to really put into gear some of that warrior energy to really push and fight and then be like a, a bit of a, a dog with a bone to, you know, to keep going. But it's a, it's vital for us as men, as you said, is to like, to bring more of this into our lives and really look at these energies and how we can, I don't want to say the word utilize, but that's the word that comes to me, utilize these in, in our, in our actions and our being. hundred percent. Yeah. Mm. So We've got the four archetypes, you know, the king, the warrior, the magician, the lover. What are the, the traits of each of them that we can kind of look at for ourselves and be like, okay, what are these like uh, real world traits that we can see in each of the, the archetypes for ourselves? Yeah, I mean, they come in stages and life cycles. And so it's different for each man. But as I mentioned, you know, that warrior lover energy, that polarity, so they sit across from each other, usually comes online first. So lover is all about claiming desire, seeing beauty, experiencing, feeling it's physical, it's embodied. And this will obviously show up in your relationship to women and the feminine and the feminine inside yourself, your relationship to your emotions. And so as young boys, you know, we're freely flowing emotion, not afraid of emotion. We're crying, we're upset, we're happy, we're blissful, we're tired, we're at ease, we're in nature. And then the conditioning comes in. So society conditions a lot of these archetypes to go a certain way. And this is where we have to break a lot of that to come into our authenticity. So the lover is really important. The lover needs to be expressed more in men. And I think it's a reawakening, you know, beautiful men like you doing this work and inviting men and being a permission slip to unleash their lover. Um, you know, the shadow of the lover when it's overexpressed is like codependency, addiction, um, you know, there can be, there's a, there's a shadow and a gift to each of the archetypes. So the lover is really important to just enjoy life itself, not needing to do anything and to dissolve boundaries. And so on the other side of that, sitting across lover is that warrior. So the warrior energy is very powerful. It's necessary. As you described, you got to go out there and get the target. You got to move towards it. It's on mission. It's discipline. It's training your body physically. It's training your mind mentally. It's tactical. It's strategic. And it's about creating boundaries. So what I see with a lot of men, because warrior energy is often shamed because in its shadow, it can be violent. It can be dominating. It can be abusive. So warrior energy has to be tempered with that lover energy. So it can actually set healthy boundaries. And you can still train your body, move, move your mission forward, your career, your family leading. And the warrior goes after that. And so he's doing it to a bigger mission. He's doing it in service to his family, to his village, to his society. 
that's a key aspect of the warrior. So this is a big part I noticed with modern men. They've kind of put this off to the side and they think they can get by without being a warrior because the warrior attracts a lot of negative energy when it's fully online in a toxic society that doesn't have the rites of passage, doesn't have the awareness of these archetypes. So men in their 20s, you know, really from the teenage years to the 20s and to the 30s are really going to work with those archetypes. Um, the magician comes in here. The magician is really important. And again, as boys, we're hyper connected to it. Our intuition, our feeling, our instincts. The magician is, has that ability to go into trance, to go into transformational experience, to shift phases. The magician is the, the way shower and the keeper of phases in a man's life. So you can think about, you know, all these, all these characters are represented in, in legends and mythology and film and literature. And the Arthurian mythology, King Arthur mythology, which, you know, is, is in your, your land, it, it represents all of them. It's actually one of the keystones. And one of my mentors um, who's just on my podcast. He like breaks it down so beautifully. You know, Lancelot is the ultimate warrior. He's the, he's the prime knight. He's like the alpha. It's the, it's the ultimate warrior. Guinevere is the ultimate lover, the feminine, the embodiment, and, you know, how the man relates to that lover. Obviously, it's his inner lover that falls in love. Merlin is the magician. So Merlin is the initiator and the holder of secret wisdom and knowledge who has the cause and effect and knows what the king needs. And, of course, the king is Arthur. So the magician archetype is really important for men to bring online, and it creates good elders. The magician creates a good keeper of knowledge that, as you mentioned, the medicine man, the shaman with indigenous tribes is necessary. He knows the healing plants. He knows the healing words. He knows the spells. He knows how to mediate conflict. He also knows what the tribe needs when it falls into crisis or chaos. So the magician in each man's life has to play this role. And this is where having a ritual, an altar, meditation, a prayer, some practice, some yoga to embody that archetype. And it's very important. And this is something that's been lost in kind of the scientific materialist culture is coming back to the sacred, to the magician. The king is the one that comes online last. And a king has stages. Obviously, a, a king to be is a prince. So a man, as he steps into his career and starts to earn money and starts to attract the attention of women and go into mateship, a man, as he starts to realize his purpose and carve his path, he's a prince. And you have that early, middle, and late prince. There's stages of princehood when he's claiming his kingdom, building his army, building his kingdom, whether that's a business, whether that's a family, whether that's a home. There's lots of ways to relate to this. It doesn't have to be grandiose. The number one takeaway I want men listening to this to understand is that this has to apply to you in your life. Mm. This isn't someone else doing this for you. You have to embody it. And you have to form a relationship with each archetype in your career, in your bedroom in your body. So the king comes online last. And usually a man, you know, Robert Moore wrote, you know, until he's in his 50s, 55, will he really manifest the full power of the king? Think about a benevolent CEO energy or think mm -hmm. about a chieftain. He knows where the tribe needs to go. He knows how to pass judgment and blessing. So the king blesses younger men, which is very important that young men receive the knowledge and the blessing of, of the king because it activates their inner king. The king is also the one with vision and command. So he knows where the group's going to go because he's in leadership. He sees it and he has the speech to back it up and the action. So he's all about being sovereign and emanating that for the whole group. Again, this can be in a relationship. This can be in your company. This can be in your community. So that archetypal wheel we walk you know, in life, it's a spiral. We keep coming back to each one and you'll always be like, you know, somewhere it's dynamic. It's a dynamic equilibrium. It's not like once you figure them all out, you're just all of them. Different parts of life call for different archetypes. It's the ultimate tool belt for the masculine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh yeah. I really loved how, um, what I really got from you saying is almost like these archetypes, they operate in our own self about what we're doing with ourselves. So there's an element, for instance, where we have to be a warrior in ourselves against maybe our, our fears and our worries and our concerns and then fight against those things. But also, and on a kind of life level is say, in, in fighting for the things that we believe in, but also on a kind of 
larger scale is fighting causes and passions that we we see the the importance in you know it's a way to to motivate oneself but also motivate larger groups of people just you know it goes outwards i really i really felt that and then and you were saying about the warrior it's like we live in an age where we are we have become very conflict averse we don't want conflict in the world right and i understand we don't want conflict but i think there's there's a way of dealing with conflict that's extremely healthy is actually having the conflict airing it all out you know having the fight having the argument and then bringing in afterwards to the the peacemaking that comes with that with conflict and also the space that conflict can create and i think this is where there's some people I think in the world that have been taught to embody this warrior. And I, I, I always think of politics because they're so power hungry and it's obviously that's gone way into a dysfunctional way of being, but they're fighting for what they, they want and what they believe in. But the, what we would call in the UK is like the middle classes have become very passive in this way. It's like, oh, we're anti-war. We don't want fighting. No one should get hurt. Everyone, everything should be peaceful all the time. But in fact, that's not actually how the fucking world works, right? That's not how we we push forward. We need to, this warrior needs to be embodied to create change, to destroy what is bad and to create what is, it is better. You know, like we've seen a lot of social change in the last, um, the last year. And I really see that, ah, change in our world very rarely happens peacefully. Like I just more and more see it. It's never like, I don't know, I think of the suffragettes in the UK, they didn't just go, you know what, ladies, you really deserve equal pay, equal rights and some voting, just, just have it. Here you go, take, take this, we, you deserve this. They had to fight for it, they had to burn down cricket pavilions, they had to jump in front of horses, they had to petition, they had to fight for what was, what was right. And it's like, <sighs> embodying this actually, embodying this, this warrior, this warrior who is focused on the right and the just, drives our society forward but equally within ourselves as as men it drives us towards what we really want it drives us towards our, our heart's desire you know that that, that that gives us meaning and purpose yes and this is a huge part of the warrior is, is the sacrifice and the devotion to a higher purpose which i i would name the guardian right because we because war is an abomination like the wars that we see fought are for oil and profit and colonization yeah. and like let's just call a spade a fucking spade yeah. um there's no such thing as a righteous war now if a tribe came in and wanted to kill you and take all your food that's when you want a guardian because they're not going to let that happen and that's that's where like the violence has a sacred purpose as a boundary setting it's like no you cannot harm my family and take my stuff you know when diplomacy fails you want guardians you want warriors but what we see in the world today, and this is sad because, you know, I have a lot of really good friends that are veterans and part of me actually early in my, when I was a teenager, thought I wanted to be um, a military officer and I was like studying military history. And it's like, you know, there's this glorious kind of draw to it because it is, it's this pure masculine purpose. Um, but what we see are soldiers. Soldiers are collapsed warriors that have become drones. They're in the shadow. They're, they're machines. They're not thinking for themselves. They're not, you know, if you're going to kill, and this is what, you know, this is a rite of passage I've yet to have, but I fully intend to is to hunt. You know, if you're going to kill, you kill with your heart. That's how the indigenous speak about it. If you're going to take an animal's life and eat its body and take its bones and its hide, you do it with your heart. You don't, you don't kill dispassionately like a machine because it's part of this life cycle. And the same thing, if you were going to take a man's life in like ancient times in a war, the true warriors, you know, think about the samurai, the Spartans, you know, these warriors that had honor, they weren't killing for fun. They weren't killing because they, they enjoyed it or wanted greed. They were guardians. They were holding a vision of a higher purpose and serving that and sacrificing for it. And I'm hoping that we have a world that our children will live in where unjust wars are, are, are a thing of the past. Mm, mm, mm. People are fighting for the wars that we fight for, not just being the wars that we, and people dying necessarily is more social fights that are for the betterment of human beings, so all human beings across the board, not for the protection of, of the overlords or the overpowered. Yeah, mm. exactly. 
And I wanted to pick up on something you said about the lover archetype, right? And this is uh, something I think for a lot of, a lot of guys that I work with is like, we have this often quite dysfunctional relationship with the lover because it's, we, we live in a world where femininity is suppressed for the most part, right? Especially a more healthy expression of femininity is definitely suppressed. So as men, it's often, this is the archetype, especially in, I, I think in, later years as we get older like maybe when we're young we're, we're expressing we're feeding the world we get into our our 20s and we start to really push ourselves in our careers and our endeavors and our purposes and often this lover archetype becomes that shrinks away we don't feel into the world anymore we, we're not taking enjoyment we're doing for the sake of doing to reach a goal all the time or, or just for the status of it you know we live in a world that status is still a, is a big thing but actually it's almost we are suppressing our own inner feminine nature which which is yearning to be expressed and felt so we can also feel the feminine in other people yeah i mean this is this is something i've heard said many times and i think it you know it's pretty contentious to say but some of the most suppressed feminine is inside of men definitely definitely feminine energy inside of men is so shamed and collapsed from the way culture has used toxic conditioning and so, you know, this is where I think the blessing of COVID and these times we're in is the great pause, the sacred pause to stop and to feel, to stop and to enjoy, enjoy what's around you, your friends, your family, your home, the village, the tribe, the inner circle, instead of constant distraction or externalization. So that's, that's, this is where, you know, for men, and it's sad because the, the rates of suicide and violent crime and imprisonment for men is like nine times that of women. And it's because of this, this lover archetype that hasn't found the simple joy of being, of loving, of intimacy. We all long for intimacy. And so a lot of men, and I know you probably see this a lot with clients, as do I, it's really permission to, to feel vulnerable and be intimate with women, obviously in our relationships, but also with other men. And this is where the men's work and the brotherhood is essential. Yeah, I see that as the, as men, we, we lack this connection with other men. We've been, I think of a lot of us, and I wonder if it's, we were growing up in an age where the, the kind of masculinity was being shamed and we grew up in a way where a lot of our fathers are distant or missing in some way, whether that's emotionally or physically um, away from us, that we we are connected to the feminine and there's the feminine is hurt by the masculine and we, we take on that for ourselves. Right. And it, it means that we are the, the, the feminine ourselves. We're like, we can't, we can't be that because there's something wrong with that. That's suppressed. Whereas women are having this great awakening of, of feminine empowerment and men are having to, there's men are living in this age still where sex is almost their right but then they've missed out the big thing, which is intimacy and connection inside of it. The, the, the true reason why I think we yearn to, to have sex is because we yearn for that feeling of union with another being or with, with, every, with, with all. And the, the easiest way for most men to even get close to that feeling is through sex and ejaculation. And hence why there's so much addiction, I think, to, to masturbation and, and porn together. But it's like we miss out on this union that we can have in our, in our own selves with our own emotions, our feelings, our awareness of ourselves and the beauty that surrounds us. Yeah. And this is this is where a lot of the mystics and the beautiful like saints and these holy men that go into renunciation. Right. And they're in an ecstatic love. Their lover is life, the goddess like Shakti, nature. And this is a powerful pathway that I was drawn to very young and then um, studying Osho and being in that, like, you know, lineage. There's a lot of beauty in isolation and nature and meditation and silence and being with the goddess, which is Gaia, the planet. Nature is just this feminine explosion of life and you can feel it. It's in, it's in you too, as a man. So this is where, yeah, a lot of men, as you said, um, sexuality or women or dating, it's like getting this fix because they're really wanting intimacy. And, you know, being intimate with someone isn't taking your clothes off and, and penetration. It's, it's being with yourself 
without armor, without thoughts, without stories, judgments, projections. It's just like, that's where the, that's where the real power and, and vulnerability comes through. And I, and I'm, I'm excited because more and more men and, and I'm sure the circles we run in and beyond, even in the mainstream, it's really starting to pick up momentum. I'm very optimistic about this century for masculinity on this planet and the, and the new ones coming, you know, the boys coming, our sons, our daughters that are going to live and grow up without all this passed on trauma. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's something I'm seeing more and more when men are coming to work with me is that they are, they're not saying they just want to meet loads of women. They're like, I really want to deeply connect with the women that I meet, whether that is just one that I want to meet, but they're looking for a depth of connection, a depth of feeling. They, they want to activate their emotions so that, because they're seeing that this lack of feeling is actually doing their, their life a lot of harm. Yeah. Mm. So one of the things you said about the magician I'd really like to get into is, is the, the knowing and the intuition. I, it's, it's, you know, I've done a lot of work with, with one of my mentors around tapping into intuition. And we live in an age of science, you know, science is our new, science and money are our gods for most people. You know, science is always right. If you can say something and say science says it, everyone goes, oh, well, it must be right. You know, because science has never, never, science has never been wrong in history. You know? um, but this, I am a big fan of this intuition, this knowing, this deep inner knowing and cultivating that because we can't always rely on the statistics for truth, but we can cultivate this, this deep inner knowing for ourselves, this feeling of awareness of being like, hmm, this is what's true, actually. This is what's true for me in this moment. And this sounds like what you're saying is really deeply embodied in the magician. Yes. And it's how do we, in this modern world, kind of cultivate that in, the, in, like I said, in the world where there's so much science, is, this is right, this is wrong, statistics, when actually there's this deeper knowing within us that's, that really holds a lot of truth for us? Well, there's a difference between information and knowledge. So there's a ton of information. With our smartphone, we can just pick it up and Google anything we want. And you can get all the information. And science gives us more and more and more data and information. But this is not useful to you unless it becomes knowledge. So knowledge is applied information that grants leverage grants understanding and so and then even beyond that is wisdom which is embodied living knowledge that is non-linear that's innate instinctual intuitional and this is something that is bred out of men only use your mind use logic be linear don't trust the unconscious. Don't trust your feelings. Emotions don't have any validity as information. Your instincts and hunches don't have any validity, right? Coincidence is just something that happens. It doesn't mean anything. What you find when you go on this path of the magician, the mystic path, which all men will find in their life at some point, it'll knock on your door. You can choose not to answer, but it'll knock again, um, is that synchronicity is, is the living truth nothing happens by chance and quantum physics what's funny is science has gone so deep into matter that now quantum physics and quantum mechanics is proving this quantum entanglement is real bell's theorem is real there's a lot of evidence to, to support it so nothing's happening by chance your consciousness is co-creating reality in the works of dr joe dispenza dr bruce lipton there's all these people that are getting big right now for spreading this information your intuition is always right. This is the mind fuck for the man who lives in his head. Your intuition, you can call it whatever you want. It's your conscience, the voice of God. It's your hunch. It's that gut instinct. Doesn't matter what you call it. Everyone has it and it's always right for you. It's not going to work for someone else. And so building a relationship to that is what brings the magician online for the masculine. And this is where ritual comes into play. This is where trance. This is where communing with nature or communing with, with God, goddess, all that is, whatever you want to call it, becomes really important. It's, it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the inner world. 
it, it's a, it's a mystery. It's a living mystery and you have to trust it and surrender to it. You're not going to be able to think your way through it. Is that the, it's, it's, it is the, 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 the magic of life, you know, the things that are unexplained that we, we feel that are true and right and, and good. It's, it's one of the things I always say about science is that science will say something doesn't exist if it can't prove it. But it doesn't mean it's not. It doesn't mean it doesn't isn't real, and it's not right. It's not correct. Like as you're saying, we've, we're bringing together people now who are saying there is this idea that we we have a deep knowing. We are deeply connected to one another, whether that be psychically, energetically. We are connected as a as a one organism. But if you said that maybe 50 years ago to people, they'd be like, "Ah, oh, that's no, nope, that can't be true. Science hasn't proved that." But there have been mystics and shaman that tell you this is how it is you're connected to the earth we're connected to the land if you spend time with it you can feel it it, it sends you messages it tells you things and i think there's such a beauty in learning to listen to the the flow of life like what comes into your space like even even me seeing you and getting in contact with you it's like i just accept that things are coming into my consciousness and my reality because they are meant to appear for me I don't need to question them. I don't need to reason them. It's like, ah, well, this is meant to be. I will follow this because this is it, this has come to me. It's um, it's a bit like how I have talked to, a, to someone recently on a podcast about uh, the right path and the wrong path. And I said, no one's ever on the wrong path. It's not possible because you're on you're on the right path because that's where you're going. There is no other path. So when clients ask me, like, you know, am I doing the right thing? Or am I on the right path? I go, yep. And, and one guy once said to me, he's like, you say that all the time. I said, yeah, because you are, because that's what's happening to you. That's what's coming to you. There's lessons here you must learn. And part of the life is to go through things that are not preferred, not ideal to gain the lessons to live. And I, I feel that's all inside this, this magician, magician archetype. It is. It's, it's, a, it's a level of mastery like the king, because they sit across from each other in the wheel that takes a lifetime of mastery. Mm -hmm. Takes a lot of time to to get into these. Yeah. Mm. One of the we kind of touched on it before around the 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 dysfunctional the uh, yeah the dysfunctional elements of the archetypes. Like you talked a little about about the warrior who can kind of get into cruelty for cruelty's sake, and I think the other end of that is the the warrior who allows cruelty to be done to him. Like what is the, what is what is it that that pushes someone either way of those in the different archetypes towards the the kind of the dysfunctional sides? Well, as you said, it, it sometimes can be a pendulum, so you have to experience the extreme or like dance with it to understand. Okay, this is there's a boundary here. I, I actually that's not serving me. So mm. it's 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 individual to each man. It's also the models we're given. So our fathers and their fathers didn't have great models. Culture gives awful models for how to embody these. Hollywood and you know most of what comes out of Hollywood and media is is completely driven by death and and suffering. It's not driven by life and and guardianship. Um, and so each archetype has those shadows to show you where they've gone off the rail. And for most men, it comes from bitterness and resentment. So if a man feels like his mission isn't being served and he doesn't feel like he's of service, he can become bitter and resentful and then he can become cruel or he can become a victim. So he can become passive and become a victim and leave his agency on the table. And unfortunately, this does happen to a lot of men. And these are the men that, you know, these are the veterans. These are the prisoners. These are the addicts. These are the, these are the, the victims of culture. And we get to we get to bring them along for the journey and their healing and their wholeness is a huge teacher to all of us. And a good civilization cares for the least among them mm. and holds them in compassion. And so this this is where our society as a whole is, is, is well, it's already happening, but we're, we're overdue for some big time shifts. Mm. We are we are really lacking in compassion i think a lot of the time in our societies like i look in the uk and our politics and sometimes i'm astounded by the things that are happening it's like oh there's people 
you know, we had this drive in the UK not too long ago where they were, what do they call it? Oh God, they always have a name for these things. Um, you know, like they're redoing some policy and it was around like our welfare system. But actually it was just a way for them to give less money to people who really needed it. And it's like, how, if we can't be compassionate to the, the most vulnerable people in our society, like what does that say about us? But also in the, also says a lot about how we treat ourselves, about our own vulnerability, you know, how we, we like demonize our own vulnerability. Like I see society often, and I say this to individuals as well, is like how your life is unfolding outside of you is really how your life is unfolding inside of you. It's just a mirror of what you, you're feeling about yourself and your attitudes towards yourself. So yeah, the, the idea that we're not looking after, we're not kind of tending to and, and lifting up the, the most vulnerable is real, it's, it's just cruelty really. Yeah, and, and it's driven by these, these lack programs, these scarcity programs, these resentment programs that are built through suffering. Hurt people hurt people. So we have to break this cycle as men and on a society level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. So one of the, the last questions I was thinking to touch upon, actually, is, is how, as men, we can embody these, these healthy aspects of the archetypes in our lives in our day-to-day lives and in our endeavors in our businesses in our relationships like how can we embody the healthy king the strong benevolent king in our lives yeah i mean this is really the ultimate goal of a man's life and you know is embodying that king and then the totality of the archetypes which the king represents that pinnacle and it's 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 a it's a group effort because you need all of them But ideally, a good king is a good warrior and a good magician and a good lover. That's the key. Um, It's cliche, but it's true. You have to lead yourself. So you got to lead your own life at the level of kingship. Then you're going to start to become externally a king. So this is where, you know, with my clients and my online courses, it's like we got to start with the basics. You got to structure your reality. That means you have to discipline your reality. That means you got to create rituals, routine. That means you have to train your body. It means you have to train your mind. That might look like, you know, diet, exercise, movement, martial arts, you know, nature immersion. That might look like meditation. That might look like some kind of practice that connects you to that. And then claiming desire. So you got to know your desires and be fearlessly in pursuit of them without shame and manifest what is yours to manifest. Every man listening on earth has a dharma, a purpose, a mission. I don't care what it is. You could be a gardener. You could be a dad. You could be a dog trainer. You could be anything, but go all in, follow your bliss, follow what's exciting to you, and then cultivate it, train it, hold the flame. And if you do that consistently in all areas of your life, and if you're in business or your career, you know, that's a great place to express it. If you're, if you're an artist, if you're a creator, create, make art. If you're a lover and you're in a relationship, you know, that's your dojo. Treat it like that. If you're a father, the children are your dojo. You know, it's all, they're all pointing in the direction of sovereignty and manifesting the strongest version of your king self, your God self, you know. The king is the the divine representative of the creator in man. And so that's your North Star. And every man has to find it for himself. Society won't find it for you. They'll give you really shitty alternatives that will make you weak. Um, Your your father can't find it for you. Your, Your wife, your girlfriend won't find it for you. Even a coach, a mentor, a shaman, an initiate who can point you in the direction and hold space they won't be able to find it for you either. This is where every man has to dream his dream and find his vision. And that's how you manifest the full power of the archetypes. To find that, that direction for yourself, like what's, the, what's driving you the purpose? Like I think I've always felt like a man who lacks purpose in his life is a man who is lacking direction and, and energy to penetrate life himself and the world because there's... If you have this higher calling, which I, I see purpose as, it's easy. We have this word we use, purpose, because it's, it feels 
easier to put into corporate pamphlets, you know, and stuff like that. But actually, a purpose is a higher calling, something greater than who you are and your your individual being. It's like when we can tap into that, then there is something bigger than ourselves that we are moving towards. And as you said, it's like our it's it's part of God, you know. It's 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 part of God's work that we do, you know. It's it's in our lives. We're all. I feel that every man and woman has been put on earth to help the human race evolve a little bit that is the god's work that we are all doing right it's a little it doesn't have to be a huge evolution it could be that you know look at my father and he has no connection really with his his children he's a very disconnected man and i saw this and was like i don't want to be like this so i've done my own work to be more connected as a man so that when i have my own children that i can give them the gift of connection but there'll be something that i am missing and my children will try and do that and i think that 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 sort of attitude towards life to be evolving the the human human race is the is the ultimate kind of sovereignty we can take on well said brother thank you thank you so i wanted to just touch on some of the other ones right because i always get this from uh i often get this from clients i said how how do i you know how do i embody more worry and i'm often like you know you need to be decisive and be ruthless as well in, in one's being with oneself. You know, I think you said it through the King. It's like being ruthless and training in, in, in the body and the mind, you know, the body, the mind and the spirit. And he said like meditation is such an important thing to learn to not so much control, but balance the, the mind and the emotions, you know, because we are living in an age now where our minds are under attack <laughs> constantly, you know, they are, they are just mere currency for, for companies to sell us things. And our attention is something that we need to cultivate so we can have laser focus attention. And I think it's such an important thing for, for a warrior to, to embody is that laser focus attention and that decisiveness in their, in their actions. Totally. I mean, this is these, I mean, you nailed it. It's body, mind, and spirit. You got to train each one and trust each one and cultivate and love them. It's about love. It's about love mm. for yourself. Ultimately, that's what every man wants is to feel love. And you ain't going to get it from outside if you can't give it to yourself. And what's beautiful is you're already inherently worthy. So that's where some of that, that deep work comes in on the spirit level of like, you're a divine spark and a unique being and you got to feel that you got to be that. And there's many pathways to get there, but they all lead the same place. And, you know, as a man, yeah, your body is important. Take care of your body, eat well, train, move. Doesn't matter what you do. You can do anything. You can be a dancer. You can be a power lifter. You can be a jujitsu artist. You can be, you know, a marathon runner. It doesn't matter. Go all in on the body. That's a key one. It's like the issues are in the tissues, train your body, develop it. And then the mind, you know, the mind is this beautiful tool. And so this is where meditation, this is where reading, like reading books has been, you know, it's, and then we live in a world where you have so much access to beautiful knowledge, you know, podcasts, audiobooks, physical books, courses, you know, anything you can imagine, train your mind, you know, absorb good information, think clearly about it. So think about it, digest it. Don't just read another book or like, you know, you got, this is where contemplation, a contemplation practice is what I train my clients to do it's the most powerful way to synthesize knowledge in, in a world of, of vast information and, and information gluttony knowledge is the rarest thing in the world right now contemplation practice i love that it's like um i find myself reading in the mornings now so i wake up and i read and i always um make sure that when i put the book down i stop for at least 10 to 15 seconds and just think about what I've been reading. I turn it over in my mind a little bit. Like, oh, how does this, how can I apply this? What does this mean for me? What does it mean for the world? Because it's so easy to, like you said, we just, we are, we are greedy with information. We'll just listen to podcast after podcast, audiobook after audiobook, read book after book, but we never really digest it and integrate into our lives and in, into who we are. And that's that kind of very uh, consumerist way that we, we've come to live just live in this world mm. yeah and in terms of the the magician like i've always seen this as a partly of a creative endeavor right 
is actually getting creative, being creating things for yourself in the world and creating things for others. But, you know, as you, you were saying before around developing intuition and developing this knowing, there's a really important side to nurturing that for a man himself to really come into his full embodiment of the, of the magician. Yeah, I mean, this is where I, spending time alone, isolation is really important. One of the shadows that won't let the magician develop is constantly being around people, over socializing, over stimulating. You have to sit with yourself. And this is where meditation, contemplation, walks, nature, you know, a morning and evening practice, a prayer like meditation, that's like you having that conversation with yourself is essential to develop the magician. Like taking things in, I see it as a, there's a, it's like the creative spark in us all, you know, the, the mystic and listening to the, you know, it might be listening to the, the sound of the wind or the, or the, what the, what you feel when you're in nature is like tuning into the, the, the energy of life more and more and, and how we can do that. Mm. And the last one, the, the lover archetype, this is, I think this is almost for me, it's been the easiest to, to tune into and tap into is because just to contemplate, as you said it before about contemplation, it's like you can contemplate the beauty of life or the beauty of anything. Like I've been studying with a, a, a tantra school for a number of years in London. And one of the exercises they gave us once last year was to just sit in front of a plant and to just fully feel the the beauty of the the plant its essence its its history its its future and i found it to be an incredible exercise to to really study something's beauty because we as we've said we live in such a consumerist age now that we don't actually spend much time to deeply look at things to really see what's there to see what's the essence of something or what has brought it to the current place that it stands but there's like this real feeling inside the lover of like taking in the beauty of life and 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 being with the, the beauty that's there. hundred percent. And that's, that's the power of the lover is actually appreciating life as it is and letting that beauty inspire and fill the man with passion, which then mm. enriches life tenfold, a hundredfold and spreads it in his relations. It allows us to be in the, uh, and also for me, it's like being in the moment because there's such a, a beauty when we can just be present to this, the moment that we're in, instead of strategizing and thinking and trying to organize for the future, that we can oh. take so much more pleasure, you know, whether that be, you know, sex is in sexual pleasure is something I talk about immensely with men is like slow down, feel more. It's not about speed, it's about your presence. Your presence is your greatest gift to the world. And I feel inside the lover is like really cultivating that level of presence and feeling each moment we are with you're speaking to someone it's like there's a beauty in just the transmission that someone's giving you and and, and feeling into that is a real gift that we can give ourselves and also the people we're with totally presence is everything for the masculine it's it's the key that unlocks all the doors in this whole conversation mm -hmm. it's almost like everything is a, a practice of developing our our presence and how present we can be with with the different aspects of ourselves. Mm. Mm. Wow, I feel like we've covered a huge amount in a, quite a short period of time, but what a, so much beautiful information, so much useful guidance for, for men who are trying to navigate the current world we live in, you know, this, this, this world that is ever shifting and moving at an amazing rate. But there has, there's these mystical archetypes that have come through from you know story into into science into you know psychology and now we can use them into our lives to to really and they're still so relevant for now as so i just think it's really beautiful to bring this message to to men who can yeah to embody this and make use them to guide them to what they really deeply desire and want in their lives whether that be business whether that be um relationships but there's really a place for all of these in our lives so thank you, thank Hold you for, for being here, Kevin. So if our listeners want to get in contact with you or work with you, I know you have an amazing course that you have got up and running at the moment. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that actually as well. 
Yeah, I mean, that that's my newest course. It's the second in the online school I've been working with, um, Masculine Mastery. So it's four weeks to master the four archetypes. It's basically the comprehensive introduction to men's work. It's take at your own pace and really beautiful. It has all the practices and perspectives that I've used um, with private clients for years and in my own life. And now it's like just nice, neat and tied up with a bow that you can just take in the you know pleasure of your own home and really go through the process of King, Warrior, Magician, Lover for yourself. And so, yeah, you can find that all in my website, which is kevinorris.com, just my name.com. And you can go under the School of Mastery. My first course, Flow State Mastery, is all about high performance habits and mastering your morning routine. So both those courses are available there. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm on social, which is where you found me. I make a lot of content and write and speak about this on camera. Um, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you just search my name, Kevin Orris, I'll come up. And yeah, I have a book as well, Sex, Masculinity, and God, The Trialogues, which I wrote with two co-authors, Cattle Last, Daniel Dick, um, which is a, it's a conversational deep dive in 10 chapters on the most taboo topics, you know, men and women, sex, death, and love, um, transgenderism, transhumanism, um, you know, infidelity sexual pain it's it's everything and it's it's a really deep philosophical work with uh pretty heavy footnotes but also very conversational and easily accessible so that's available on amazon wow that sounds phenomenal sounds phenomenal and if people want to work with you privately what's the best way to get in contact with you yeah i mean you can on my website you can apply and see you know past clients and um if you want to do the one-on-one -on -one mentorship, you know, send an email is the best way, which is kevin at kevinorris.com. So happy to respond. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, sir. So grateful for your, your energy and your, your knowledge and your wisdom on this episode. It's been incredible to have you. Yeah, thanks um, yeah. for so much for having me, David. It's been an honor. Thank you. Cheers, buddy. Thanks very much.